Good morning and welcome to the Web Trusted CI webinar for May 24th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dobheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is identifying vulnerable GitHub repositories and scientific cyber infrastructure an artificial intelligence approach. Our presenter is Sagar Samtani. Um, Dr. Samtani is an assistant professor at the Grant Thornton Scholar and a Grant Thornton Scholar in the Department of Operations and Decision Technologies at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, we've got some planned um, stopping points to take questions, so go ahead and type them in and we'll read through them at those points. Um, and we also have uh, time at the end for questions as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Sagar. Sagar, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, excellent. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Okay, can you uh, see my screen, the full screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, excellent. So let me go ahead and get started here. So first of all, you know, a big thank you to uh, to Jeanette, Vaughn, Jim, uh, and the rest of the Trusted CI folks for allowing me to uh, present today. I know that the title that Jeanette had uh, indicated has a lot of buzzwords in there, vulnerabilities, GitHub repositories, scientific CI, AI, and so on. What I really hope to do is kind of debunk some of those terms and why they fit together uh, in the way that they do throughout the, throughout the talk here. So as Jeanette mentioned, I'm currently an assistant professor at Indiana University, and the work that I'm presenting today is with one of the doctoral students that I work with here at Indiana University as well, Ben Lazar, and as well as collaborators from University of Texas San Antonio, and also at the University of Arizona as well. Um, some of the work that I'm presenting today is based off of uh, some work that we have ongoing with the uh, National Science Foundation, specifically through the CC program, and I'll provide a little bit of an overview of that uh, as well here. So uh, the talk is really split up into three major sections. First, what I'll be doing is I'll be giving a little bit of an overview of the project. So I'll kind of take a 30,000 foot view level and a lot of this will likely be reviewed for this particular audience, uh, but really kind of hone in on what are the key problems that we're trying to address. In the second part of the talk, what I'll go ahead and do is I'll get deeper into our particular approach. And this is where the AI component com kind of comes into play is that what is our approach uh, to solve some of the problems that we've identified within a larger landscape? And I'll go into a lot more technical details in, at this particular uh, part of the talk and happy to you know, take some more questions offline for you know, some more of the technical details as well. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll present some of the selected results and uh, conclude with some thoughts in terms of where we can go uh, beyond the study here as well. At, uh, at the conclusion of each one of these sections, I'll go ahead and pause for a couple minutes to see if there's any questions uh, from the audience. I got my uh, double screen up here so I can see if there's anything that, that comes through. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, see if there's any questions at that point before progressing to the, to the next uh, section. So a little bit of background about myself, as Jeanette noted, uh, I'm in the Kelly School of Business at the uh, in the Operations and Decision Technologies Department at Indiana University. I earned my doctorate from uh, the University of Arizona, and there I served as an NSF Scholarship for Service uh, student, wherein the SFS program is designed to help train students for eventual placement into government or academic positions, and is trained training them in cybersecurity related uh, content. My dissertation focused a lot on developing artificial intelligence for cybersecurity applications. In particular, I focused a lot on developing deep learning and network science based approaches to tackle issues in cyber threat intelligence, uh, in dark web analytics, and scientific cyber infrastructure security, and so on. And you'll see flavors of that starting to come through uh, throughout the talk today as well. So I don't think I really need to. Uh, emphasize to this particular audience the importance of cybersecurity. I will say that, uh, just make a couple of notes about it uh, in light of some of the more recent events. It has been labeled as a significant national priority uh, and we've seen recent executive orders from the, the White House, uh, you know, placing more and more emphasis in, in terms of things such as cybersecurity information sharing, uh, more transparency in terms of code, coding and software development and supply chains and those types of things. 
I will say kind of just taking a, a 30,000 foot view level in terms of what national, the National Science Foundation is doing in terms of cybersecurity, there's really what I call the three major programs that are funding cybersecurity related research at the National Science Foundation. Um, and they're all focused on, on different uh, levels or different kind of areas. The SATSI program, uh, you know, one of the largest programs within the National Science Foundation that focuses on funding fundamental cybersecurity research and education activities, uh, as well as transition to practice efforts that I know that Trusted CI is heavily involved with as well. The Scholarship for Service program, which is designed to train students in cybersecurity uh, uh, related topics for eventual placement into government, so it's more workforce development. And then Cybersecurity Innovation for Cyber Infrastructure, which I know this community is very familiar with, which is developing operational cybersecurity capabilities for a lot of the investments that, that NSF has placed into scientific cyber infrastructures. So just looking at the uh, CC program website today, you know, the awards database, there's, you know, this CC program has been around for the last about five, six years and about 50 awards that have been made about $50 million that have been awarded uh, from a lot of different PIs from many, many different universities. And we can see that the fundamental uh, focus is kind of motivated by protecting the scientific cyber infrastructure that NSF has spent so much money to try and develop and, and launch as well. And over the years, some of the topics that have kind of emerged in this area as key areas of focus within the CC program relate to things such as uh, securing cyber infrastructure, not, you know, things like novel, trustworthy design approaches, frameworks, models, et cetera, protecting research data, so data sets and provenance and, and those types of things. And then in the last solicitation, what we saw is discovering vulnerabilities within scientific cyber infrastructure. So being pro proactive in terms of the posture of what is uh, <clears throat> what a particular scientific CI has in terms of their vulnerabilities and looking at it from a more holistic and proactive perspective. So the, the project that we're kind of working in is uh, was funded back in 2019. And we have a, a team of, of folks uh, from the University of Arizona, as well as major scientific cyber infrastructures, such as Cyverse, which is a, a science gateway for uh, for large um, for life sciences, and then uh, LEO, Landscape Evolution Observatory, that aims to answer the question of how does life come on this planet by analyzing uh, the temperatures and soil and, and, and those types of things, uh, and water, water, and so on. So what our particular project is focused in on is um, we're focused in on trying to not only identify the vulnerabilities that are within some of these scientific cyber infrastructures, but also being able to systematically categorize them, being able to also identify what kinds of exploits could be potentially targeting some of those vulnerabilities as well, looking at the uh, you know, dark web to see what kinds of exploits are on there and what kinds of vulnerabilities they could point to and so on. So I'm not going to talk too much about, you know, the objective, the first and third objectives of our, our overall project, but I'll talk some more about some of our, uh, some of our more emerging uh, research related to scanning scientific cyber infrastructure for vulnerabilities. That's what I'll really focus in on for, for today's talk. If we kind of take a step back, and I know that uh, you know Vaughn and Sean Pichard have done a, a tremendous job in terms of advancing our knowledge about what are scientific CI assets and and so on. But if I take a step back and, and really look at what are the different categories of scientific CI assets, you know we can really break them down broadly into things such as instruments, facilities, systems, software, scientific CI data, and so on and so forth. And I've gone ahead and um, uh, boxed in some of the areas that are really kind of emerging within the uh, scientific CI space. And we know that there, a lot of scientific CIs are going to have access to specific facilities and systems, and you know they have their own data and they have their own proprietary instruments that they're operating on top of, and so on. But increasingly, we're seeing a lot of focus in terms of providing uh, user bases the ability to configure their own virtual machines, configure their own workflows configure their own environments such that they can go ahead and uh, do science the way that is suitable for their particular discipline. Moreover, a lot of we're seeing a lot of emphasis in terms of from the National Science Foundation and also from larger scientific entities for scientific reproducibility in terms of code transparency, code availability, and so on. So we're seeing a lot of emphasis in terms of the, the provision of a lot of the code that's developed from research to be publicly accessible and to distribute it to be distributable for uh, enhancing scientific reproducibility. Now, this is all well and great, but I think one of the key things that really to kind of keep in mind is that, you know, as a, as a scientist, and I kind of take the perspective of a grad student, assistant professor, or, you know, associate professor, and so on, 
we're very focused on trying to get the next publication, trying to do our science, trying to get our work out there and so on. And so we may code just to be able to get the work done, but not necessarily be able to get it into a production environment. Now, naturally, there's mechanisms such as transition to practice and others that will help facilitate the development of production level code and so on. But a lot of times when you're doing AI related research, for example, you just want to kind of get your work out there. And so the, the code base may not be as robust as what, uh, what you'd hope it to be. Now, I, I'm, I think that a lot of folks are very familiar with, with GitHub, which is one of the prevailing uh, social coding repositories that's out there. But you know, one of the powerful things about GitHub, is it allows you to post the code, share the code, et cetera. But in the process of doing that, a lot of the code that is that may be shared may possess vulnerabilities within them. And those vulnerabilities could be things such as leaked API keys. They could be leaked secrets, uh, usernames and passwords. They could be if a user launches that code base, there might be it might have some susceptibilities to shell injections and, and, and so on. So this is an example of a GitHub repository that uh, is within a major scientific CI. And, and I've throughout the talk, I've tried to anonymize the scientific CIs that we're working with to not to you know, maintain their privacy. But uh, we can see that there's vulnerabilities that are, are, are within the, the code base that could allow the, the you know, folks that are launching this code to have susceptibilities in their environment. Now, if we kind of look at what are the different types of vulnerability assessment tools, this is a, a, just a broad categorization. And by the way, the slides are also going to be available after the talk as, as well, in case you want to get more details about this. But there are really kind of four major areas of vulnerability assessment tools, just broadly speaking. And there's going to be some overlap between each category as well. Things such as general purpose scanners that will look at general IT systems to identify if there's outdated uh, outdated operating systems and those types of things. Those scanners that are designed for web applications uh, to monitor network traffic. But then there's also a, a category of monitoring uh, code and uh, code itself to see if there's vulnerabilities within the, the code itself. Now, one of the key things that's needed though is that a lot of the vulnerability scanners are going to generate a tremendous amount of data uh, that are indicating what kinds of vulnerabilities exist within that uh, environment or the asset that's being scanned and uh you know a lot some of my friends that i work with uh they are SOC analysts and they always indicate to me the size of the uh, vulnerability assessment scans that come in that the quantity of data that comes through is just tremendous and finding ways to to uh, analyze that and prioritize that can, it can be a very difficult task and if we kind of look at what is the existing landscape in terms of uh, scientific co or uh, social coding repository research, a lot of research that have studied GitHub repositories or Stack Overflow and so on have, have been very general purpose in, in nature. So things such as detecting you know, users or key users and, and, and specific categories of vulnerabilities and so on. But there's really a lack of comprehensive vulnerability scanning across uh, scientific CI social coding repositories. Uh, one thing I will notice is, note is that a lot of the techniques that are being used, a lot of the methodologies that are being used in this space are based off of network science principles. So representing repositories and users as nodes on a network and then capturing the relationships on, on with, with them and then applying deep learning techniques and so on, hence the you know artificial intelligence ca ca capabilities that uh, that are emerging within this area. But one of the key limitations here is that there, there hasn't been work that has really integrated vulnerability assessment into the AI-based pr pr procedures to really do fundamental tasks such as identifying groups of repositories that need, uh, that need mitigation or that need remediation, that need prioritization and, and so on. So what we're really focused in on with this particular stream of work, and I'll give an example, uh, uh, you know, I'll walk through an example of some of our recent research in this area, is that you know the size and the scale of the repositories uh, within a scientific CI, as well as the vulnerabilities that could come back from prevailing tools, is could be quite prohibitive in the way that uh, vulnerability management is being done. Things ranging from prioritization, mitigation, remediation, and so on, and developing approaches that are rooted in deep learning or graph embedding methods to group repositories and to facilitate some of these tasks can be quite. Powerful. So really what we're trying to do is detect the vulnerabilities in these scientific CIs uh, with prevailing code vulnerability assessment tools, and then also trying to 
group the repositories based off of their based off of their vulnerabilities. If there's you know the a lot of vulnerabilities that have high severity, low severity, and so on, to facilitate things such as vulnerability prioritization and remediation efforts. So with that, I'll go ahead and pause here for a moment uh, and see if there's any questions that come through the chat um, about uh, about the first part of the talk. Oh, here um, we have a question. Yep. Are you looking at GitHub tools like, um, <laughs> and then there's a link here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Jim. Um, that's a great question. I'll talk about the tools that we're using here in a moment. Uh, to answer the question directly, no, we're not using those tools. Uh, and the reason why is because a lot of those tools, we, our team has looked into those tools. They have to be at this stage, and it's been about a month since we've looked at it, but they have to be enabled by the users for the vulnerabilities to be identified. And so we're taking the external perspective of like, these are the repositories that an entire scientific CI may have, right? Externally, what are the vulnerabilities that we can scan from that environment that doesn't require the users to have vulnerability scanning to be, um, to be enabled by default. So it allows us to get the data, but it doesn't it allows us to get the data with our own tools, but it doesn't require the user to actually have the vulnerability scanning mechanism enabled on their side that would allow people to get their vulnerability assessment reports. It's a great question. Okay, great. Okay, so let me go ahead, uh, Jeanette, shall I go ahead and proceed to the second part of the talk? Yes, please. Okay, excellent. So uh, in the second part of the talk, what I'm really going to go ahead and do is I'm going to get deeper into to methodology here. And this is the AI component of it, uh, so to speak. Um, and it, before I get into that, I think I, I just want to kind of give my perspective on the role of AI for, for, for cybersecurity and, and where does it actually play a role. Those are buzzwords that, that are, are uh, within the landscape. Artificial intelligence can do amazing things, self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. Cybersecurity is important. We've seen uh, attacks on colonial pipeline and, and, and solar winds and, and so on and, and so on and so forth there. But really, if we kind of take a step back and think about the role of AI for cybersecurity, cybersecurity is a domain that is quite data rich, but information poor. There's a lot of data that's being generated from many different sources, whether we look at internal network data, such as works, uh, workstation logs, server logs, uh, you know, router logs, et cetera, or external data sources, such as the dark web and public exploit repositories and malware data sets and so on. There's just a lot of data with a tremendous amount of heterogeneity, and as well as um, a lot of uh, variety and velocity. It's constantly evolving, it's adversarial in nature, and so on. And AI, the role of AI in cybersecurity is, in my mind, twofold. Uh, one is to automate a lot of procedures that a human does uh, manually. So a human may look at a vulnerability assessment report and say, okay, I know that this vulnerability assessment report for this asset looks similar to another asset that I have. I'm going to group them together so I can you know, do targeted prioritization and remediation off of them. So AI can help automate some of those procedures. But I think the second thing, too, is that it can also identify um, patterns that are non-trivial for a human to detect. Are there underlying patterns in terms of specific data points that we should monitor and be aware of and update our knowledge about? So AI can help out a lot in, in that regard. And so I'll get into some of what we're doing with, uh, with, with that in specific categories of uh, methodology as well in this particular section. So, um, okay, so the specific research questions, uh, and again, this is, this is part of a, uh, a, a doctoral student's work here. Uh, so we're going at it from more of an academic perspective is that the specific research questions is that how can we identify vulnerabilities within GitHub repositories? We know that there's a lot of tools that are out there. Jim, you asked a great question about, you know, are you using this particular set of tools from GitHub and so on? So how do we go about and, and doing that in a way that will give us information about or data about what kinds of vulnerabilities exist within these repositories? But then the second part is that how can we group repositories? How can we group repositories based off of their vulnerabilities and their relationships as well? 
So we've developed a, a research framework with four or five major components uh, that I'll talk through some of them a little bit more uh, in detail versus others. But what we've gone ahead and done is we've partnered with two major scientific cyber infrastructures uh, to identify what are the different types of repositories on their environment and you know, generating summary statistics about them and, and so on. And then to do vulnerability assessment on them as well. You see a lot of interesting pictures of different tools that we've uh, deployed. The real AI component comes in in these three is set, these sections three and four of the of the framework, which is we're constructing a graph that represents the data, the data meaning the GitHub repositories, the users, the vulnerabilities that are on those GitHub repositories, and so on. And then we've developed an algorithm that will actually allow us to represent each of the each of the repositories, almost like developing a, a, a resume for each of the repositories based off of the relationships as well as their vulnerabilities. And we've done a series of experiments and case study, you know, the academic rigor part to identify whether or not our proposed method actually outperforms existing uh, models. So let me go ahead and get into some of the uh, details about the way that we conducted the, the, the data collection and, and repository analysis and so on. So what we did is that we use a GitHub API uh, to collect information about the repositories and users for two large and uh, long-standing NSF funded CIs. And I've uh, anonymized them to CI1 and CI2. I provided some additional detail, just to provide a little bit of context about how big they are and, and, and how long they've been running and so on. Um, but what we did is with the GitHub API, we collected all of the repositories, we collected all of the information of within them going down to the commit level uh, and going down to the users that have committed and, and so on, such that we have a comprehensive data set that we can operate off of. And overall, the, the total collection that we have, we have about 2,700 uh, or about 2,800 different repositories across both of those scientific CIs. And you can see in this particular table, we've broken it down into root repositories and fork repositories for both of those uh, scientific CIs. For both of those CIs, the root repository quantity is lower than the forked repository, indicating that there is a lot of activity in terms of the way that people, their user base is actually forking and copying those root repositories for their own uh, purposes. And we can see the quantity of the commits for, for each of them uh, uh, as well. So overall, Scientific CI2 has significantly more repositories, forking activity, and contributions to, than, uh, than CI1. But the other part, too, is that the top two languages are in C++ and in Python. And this is important because that helps dictate the types of vulnerability assessment scanners that we can leverage as well. So getting a little bit to, um, to Jim's question here uh, is that what kinds of tools, uh, and I'm kind of just looking a little bit deeper here, what kind of tools would be suitable to do this type of analysis? So we selected four open source vulnerability assessment scanners uh, for, based on several criteria. Uh, the first one is that what is their coverage in terms of the languages that they scan for? So as we noticed that the uh, majority of the languages in these repositories are either based in Python or in C, C++, some variant of C there. And we also looked at it in terms of their usability. So our, when I say usability, can they be deployed on the raw source code itself, or do they need to, an endpoint wherein the source code is deployed in some application, then we go ahead and do that. So we selected the vulnerability assessment scanners that are usable on the raw source code itself, and are able to assess the vulnerabilities there, as well as the age of the vulnerability assessment scanners and so on. When we started this analysis, GitHub had not yet released its capabilities for doing the vulnerability assessment uh, by for, for users to enable their vulnerability assessment on their repositories. Our team looked into that, whether that would be suitable or not. And we, at the end of the day, were not able to put that into action for several reasons. The most important being is that we're taking the perspective of an external attacker that's coming in. If an external attacker is doing reconnaissance on these repositories, right? what is the type of information of vulnerabilities that they'll be able to find based off of the information that's publicly accessible? They won't have access to specific users in the repositories to enable the vulnerability scanning. And the second thing is that even if a user has enabled their vulnerability scanning, um, the results of their vulnerability assessment scanners, you can't just pull it through the API. That would be 
almost like a massive breach of privacy in a sense. So for that purpose, we stuck with these particular tools. And these tools also have an excellent coverage in terms of the types of vulnerabilities that they scan for as well. So they, they can scan for things such as secrets, you know, are there uh, different passwords and API keys and so on, insecurities such as insecure functions and so on, and then also attacks such as injection, cross-site scripting, and those types of things. You can see the coverage for each of those tools here as well. Okay, getting into the quantity of vulnerabilities that uh, that came back. Overall, Scientific CI2 has the highest number of vulnerabilities uh, at about 1.4 million. And one thing I want to point out with many of these tools is that they will return a severity score uh, for the vulnerabilities, similar to what a vulnerability assessment tool such as Nessus would do with uh, you know, the CVSS scores and so on. A lot of these tools will categorize them into high, medium, low severities. And for some of the tools, uh, our team has gone ahead and also consulted with experts in terms of where does this fall in terms of severity of the vulnerability and so on. So we can see that for, for both of the scientific CIs, uh, the high, medium, and low, there's a, the lowest percentage is going to be within the high category. And then the low vulnerabilities is going to make up almost 80 to 90% of the vulnerabilities within that particular uh, environment. Now, this is quite important because scientific CIs uh, may not have the same resourcing in terms of pure cybersecurity staff that an enterprise IT organization may have. The you know cybersecurity staff at Microsoft is going to look markedly different from a scientific CI that's been funded for a million dollars for three years. It's just going to be at a different scale and level. So there's going to be limited capability and capacity to be able to remediate all of the vulnerabilities. So where does somebody actually pay attention to? Do they pay attention to the lower occurring but higher severity vulnerabilities or do they pay attention to the lower severity but higher quantity of, of vulnerabilities? So we'll answer that in a, in a second here, but what we went ahead and did with the data that came back is that if we kind of recall what was done in the past social coding repository uh, analysis, a lot of it is based off of network science-based perspectives. So constructing a graph wherein you represent users and repositories in a particular graph and the relationships that are between them as well as a bipartite network. So getting into some of the details here, we denote the bipartite network as a graph G, uh, where it's a directed graph where if a user has committed to a repository, there's a link between those two uh, entities. And the U is the node set of all of the users that have contributed to repository and R is the node set of all repositories. The F in this particular uh, notation is the feature matrix for each of the nodes. So what we're trying to do here is that based off of the vulnerabilities that have been identified, what are the vulnerabilities that are associated with each repository and each user? So we assign that as a list of features for each of the nodes. And following network science uh, principles and also best practice in the space, we project the bipartite network into two monopartite networks. So we have a graph on repositories and a graph on users. And we're able to identify who are the key users, who are the key repositories, and also conduct finer grained analysis on, on either one of those. So given the focus of this particular study, we only focus in on the repository level analysis in this, uh, in this part. So getting into the quote unquote, the more AI component of this, um, if we wanna group users and repositories based off of the relationships and we don't have any a priori knowledge about it, right? We can turn to an emerging category of uh, deep learning based methods and, and uh, methods that are designed to operate on graph structures, specifically graph embedding methods. The idea of graph embedding methods is that based off of the graph, based off of each node's relationships and the features that they possess, representing each of those nodes in a low dimensional vector space such that you can do tasks such as clustering, clustering similar uh, nodes together or classification or link prediction and so on. So this is really an emerging area that we've seen over the last three to four years uh, of graph embedding work, which is focused in on how do you analyze graph structured data. So what we can see is that if we don't have any a priori knowledge about what 
do the you know groups of uh, repositories look like? We can't construct supervised learning algorithms off of that. I mean, we can do it if we you know do manual labeling and and, and those types of things. Uh, but really looking at it from an unsupervised point of view, and there's really three emerging or three techniques that operate in an unsupervised fashion. TADW, which is text associated deep walk, graph convolutional autoencoder, and then graph attention network. But irrespective of these um, methods, the way that they operate, one key thing to uh, keep in mind is that these methods were not designed to operate in cybersecurity contexts, and that they will often miss some of the nuances and the key domain requirements that we have within cybersecurity. For example, accounting for the severity and the quantity of the vulnerabilities when we're constructing the embeddings and so on. So in this particular work, what we did is that we designed uh, what we call the vulnerability associated deep walk. And it's a busy slide here, but I'll go ahead and walk through some of the intuitions here. The proposed method of extends the TADW, which is the, one of the prevailing uh, graph embedding methods, to have two sets of novelties within it. One is a vulnerability severity feature weighting approach, wherein we adapt what is known as TFIDF, which is from text analytics literature, to operate off of how severe and how much of vulnerability appears within a particular GitHub environment. And then we extend the objective function of the TADW method such that it accounts for that feature weighting during the embedding generation process. The key design intuition of our algorithm is that the VADW prioritizes when generating the embeddings, low quantity, high severity vulnerabilities over the vulnerabilities that have a high quantity but are low severity. So what that does is that repositories that have a higher level of severity but low quantity of the vulnerabilities would be grouped together, whereas the repositories that are have a lot of low severity vulnerabilities would be grouped together as well. So we can go to specific groups of repositories and say, okay, we know that this has high severity vulnerabilities. Let's prioritize the repositories in this particular environment first before, uh, before getting to some of the other ones if we have the capacity to, to do that. So some more of the design intuition here. I'll go, I'll just go ahead and skip through these particular slides, but again, kind of just following through with the, uh, the idea that we're trying to prioritize the higher severity, lower quantity vulnerabilities that appear within the data set over the vulnerabilities that are lower severity, high quantity. And then this is how we in incorporate it into the uh, objective function of the VADW. Again, happy to talk more offline if you wanna know more about the mathematical details and, and the proofs behind it and, and so on. I think the key thing that I wanna note from this particular uh, slide is that after the embeddings have been generated from this particular method, we can go ahead and input them into clustering algorithms such as k-means to identify groups of repositories with those similar vulnerability characteristics. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause here. I know that I just covered a, a, a lot of content uh, fairly quickly as well. Are there any questions from the audience that I can go ahead and answer before getting into some of the experimental results and case study results as well? Looks like we had a question here. Um, CI2 was founded in 1956 in some of the code is some of the code 50 years old? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question. You know, a lot of the code within that environment has been posted within the last five to 10 years. Um, so I don't know if their code bases from 40, 50 years ago are on that particular environment. We can look that up. I think I think that, that uh, that's a really interesting one. And it would allow us to also identify and ask questions such as how does a vulnerability landscape evolve over a period of time based off of the technologies that are deployed and, and so on and so forth across uh, across multiple uh, GitHub environments? That's a great question. What does it mean uh, that you found 24,025 secret vulnerabilities in CI2? Yeah, so what that means is that there's 24,000 instances of secrets being publicly accessible, whether they be API keys or usernames and passwords and other vulnerabilities that fall within that secrets category. Yes, quite scary. <laughs> I said yikes as well. And then I told my doctoral student that um, 
this is a promising area of research if there's that many vulnerabilities in there. So, <laughs> okay. Job security. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Here we go. We've got another one. Um, after running the vulnerability scanners, did you manually inspect a subset of the results for false positives? Yes, absolutely. And we did actually, let me take that back. Yes and no. Uh, yes, we did where we looked for it, but then more importantly, we reached out to our partners to identify, to ask them, does this actually exist in there? And we get, we actively seek their feedback to identify if those vulnerabilities actually exist. But we didn't just hand them the vulnerability assessment scanning reports. Uh, I, I want to make that point uh, really, really clear as well. We handed them the results in the case study about the different clusters and the repository, uh, repositories within specific clusters such that they can do more targeted manual uh, verification of the vulnerabilities that existed within there. Great question. Okay, shall I proceed, Jeanette? I think so. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So um, the next four or five slides are just showing the academic rigor. Um, if you wanna take a little coffee break during that time, that's, that's totally fine. But the basic idea here is that uh, we evaluated the VADW against state-of-the-art graph embedding models that account for nodal features. That includes the TADW, graph convolutional autoencoder, and gate. And we did two sets of experiments actually to evaluate the their ability to cluster um, the uh, the repositories and we, can, we created gold standard data sets and, and, and so on. I'm happy to share those details offline. Um, but we did two sets of experiments. The first one being is that we aim to identify how well does the VADW actually cluster all repository types. So irrespective of if it's a fork or if it's a root repository, how well does it cluster any repository type at all? But then the second experiment is that we look to see whether or not the VADW could better cluster repositories that are root repositories only. And here's the intuition behind that. Once a repository has been forked, it can sometimes fall outside of the purview of that particular scientific CI that initially launched the initial root repository. So they may not have the ability to actually control that forked repository anymore. So looking at the root repositories, that's something that they still have control over. Therefore, you know, seeing how well the method actually operates on root repositories only can help out a lot in terms of being able to uh, you see how it, we can manage root repositories or scientific CI can manage those root repositories that are directly within their control. Looking at experiment one, res one results, for both of the scientific CIs, our method outperformed the benchmark methods uh, by statistically significant results uh, across five different evaluation metrics. And again, happy to share the details of why we selected those metrics and the gold standard data sets and so on. And really what this indicates is that the existing embedding methods uh, do not capture the critical vulnerability features properly. What I mean by properly is that the severity and the quantity of the high severity vulnerabilities and the low severity vulnerabilities, the quantities of them, all of these methods don't account for that. Um, so the VADW's ability to capture that helped to group some of those repositories a little bit more effectively. The other key thing here is that it performed well on both of the scientific CIs. And as we saw with some of the vulnerability assessment results that came back, as well as the repository types, those scientific CIs have a different GitHub footprint altogether. So the types of vulnerabilities, the, uh, the quantity and so on are different across both. And VADW's ability to perform well and across both of those footprints indicates its potential ability to generalize across different scientific CIs rather than being over-engineered to a particular scientific uh, cyber infrastructure. And this is an example of a particular vulnerability that was missed. This repository is misclustered uh, uh, during the experiments. Our method was able to pick it up, but the other ones were, were uh, not able to pick it up. So this one is a high severity vulnerability that is a file permission vulnerability that was clustered into the low severity group into the high severity one. And this is just an example of, of one repository that falls into that category. When we look at the root repository, we see a similar uh, type of performance improvement as well, wherein the uh, VADW outperformed across all the metrics, except for one on scientific CI, uh, scientific CI1, 
uh, for, for this particular experiment. And this indicates that it, it, the VADW's ability to outperform the benchmarks is not limited to just all of the repositories, but also targeted groups of repositories, in this case, the root repositories only. And again, another example of a high severity uh, vulnerability that was miscategorized into the low severity group. But let's go ahead and zoom back out outside of the academic uh, rigor part. And this is the part that I think that, you know, getting feedback would be uh, immensely valuable for, for our group. How does one actually operationalize what we have uh, proposed as part of this research and integrate it into uh, an operational environment? I know this is conversations that I've uh, had with Vaughn and, and others at Trusted CI as well. How do we go ahead, how does one actually use this? So in general, the high level procedure of actually operationalizing this would be as follows. And I'll illustrate a case study that does this. One is that an organization can go ahead and collect their entire GitHub uh, environment uh, and their GitHub environment, you know, automated scripts to, you know, pull in through the API. And we're happy to share that uh, uh, those code bases as well to, to support that. And we'll make sure that it's scrubbed of any vulnerabilities before uh, before sharing that. The second thing is uh, scanning for the vulnerabilities using the different tools. Third one is constructing the graph, the graphs and then generating the embeddings. And then the final one is a cluster analysis. So running through this entire procedure, we have automated scripts that'll go through each of these to help facilitate this type of analysis. But let's see what the value that it comes out from this. What we did is that we took one of our scientific CIs and we went through that entire procedure, collected the data, did the vulnerability assessment scans, uh, and then did the network construction, embedding generation, and clustered them together as well. And we ran for, I think, about nine different clusters uh, on that scientific CI uh, to, to identify what kinds of groups of vulnerabilities exist in the uh, groups of repositories and what vulnerabilities exist within them. So what we can see here is that there's actually some very finely grained, uh, finely, uh, I'm sorry, tightly linked clusters here together. And in clustering analysis, the goal is to have high intra cluster similarity. So a lot of the data points within a cluster is tightly linked. And then the distance between clusters is quite large. It should be uh, large as well. And so this clustered actually quite nicely, but we can see different clusters of repositories and delving in a little bit further into them, what we can see, say in cluster D, we can see that there's specific passwords, secrets, insecure functions, and so on, and the repositories that they belong to, and the count of those uh, uh, vulnerabilities as well for that particular cluster. This is a lot more targeted than just handing somebody a vulnerability assessment report and say, have at it. Because when you hand somebody a vulnerability assessment report, there's no context about what other repositories look similar to this one. How many vulnerabilities exist for different repositories that have this particular vulnerability in them? How severe are those vulnerabilities vis-a-vis -vis other ones that are of high interest to us as well? So this type of clustering analysis gives us the ability to look in and say that this particular cluster have these categories of vulnerabilities that affect specific repositories to do much more targeted and fine grained uh, remediation and uh, prioritization and so on. So Terry, going back to, to your uh, question, we had our partners look in to these repositories to identify if they actually possessed these vulnerabilities. And a lot of them actually did, and they took remediation steps to help mitigate that, which I'll talk about some of the uh, steps that could be taken uh, in, the, in light of these types of results. Um, but we didn't hand them the vulnerability assessment report scans. We handed them these results. And these results were a lot more targeted. Now they could go to a specific repository. Ah, you know, these are the different types of secrets that we should be aware of and so on. So kind of the question that comes up is that, um, what do we do about about these types of uh, vulnerabilities, and what do we do about you know mitigating them and, and and so on? So, this is the part that you know getting the feedback from the audience would be uh, very very helpful as well. Is that you know for there's different categories of vulnerabilities that are uh, available: secrets, file permissions, insecure functions, insecure inputs, and so on. And they all have their own potential threat or you know threat models associated with them as well. So, for example, for a secret, uh, if you have an AWS API key that's publicly accessible. Somebody could take that API key and start abusing cloud computing resources and then, and, and so on. Some of the remediation strategies can be discontinuing the use of these leaked secrets. 
But then other ones are a little bit more um, difficult to do, wherein it's letting the users know about the vulnerabilities in there and suggesting targeted remediation strategies, such as updating their packages that they're that they're using or discontinuing the use and so on and so forth for that. But with those with the results that have come through, it's much easier to uh, suggest some of those remediation strategies rather than uh, rather than just having them, you know, be general guidelines and so on. Okay. So zooming back out to the uh, to the higher level here, I'll spend the last couple of minutes before opening it up for uh, for questions is that um, scientific CIs use social coding repositories such as GitHub to facilitate development of open source software, advanced scientific processes and so on. This is, you know, from the NSF and NIH, you know, more transparency and code based of scientific reproducibility and so on. But this can come at a cost wherein uh, some of these repositories may contain vulnerabilities that uh, when you run a vulnerability assessment scanner, you, you know, we saw some of the results that came through 1.4 million vulnerabilities. That's a lot of vulnerabilities to have to sift through. Um, so what we tried to do in this particular study is develop a novel graph embedding based approach to automatically identifying cluster repositories with similar vulnerabilities for advanced prioritization mitigation strategies. And we tried to illustrate the um, value of the uh, of the proposed approach by grouping repositories from major scientific CIs, as well as proposing some mitigation strategies that could help uh, address some of these vulnerabilities. I think when looking out to the future in terms of what are some future uh, directions that, that can be done, um, I listed out four here, but happy to get some more thoughts uh, from the audience as well, is that we can start to um, look at, uh, we can scan repositories for vulnerabilities at the commit level to identify when vulnerabilities were introduced. So almost doing that kind of temporal analysis to see when vulnerabilities were introduced, how does a vulnerability landscape over evolve over time and so on. We can also identify how vulnerabilities propagate across repositories. Increasingly, at least within the AI space, there's uh, an increased emphasis on workflow development. Uh, and I think, you know, with Andrew Ung's course on Coursera and deep learning, it's pipelines and workflows of, uh, of ML and deep learning based approaches. Seeing how vulnerabilities pass those types of environments can be very interesting to see if there is a vulnerability that will allow an attacker to actually tunnel through to different types of assets. The other one, uh, third one could be pinpointing key users posting vulnerabilities for more targeted security awareness trainings. And this is something that, you know, collaborating with Trusted CI would be great. You know, it's targeted security awareness trainings based off the vulnerabilities for specific categories of users and so on. It's almost like a recommendation system that will recommend particular users that are engaging in uh, maybe more risky coding behaviors and so on. But then also grouping uh, repositories for emerging categories of scientific inquiry. If we consider the larger AI space, conferences such as KDD, CIKM, ICML, NeurIPS, uh, ICLR, and so on, there's a lot of emphasis in terms of having the code basis from the papers that are uh, published publicly accessible. Can we collect all of those repositories and do a large scale analysis of not only conventional vulnerabilities, such as the ones that we scan for here, but AI security vulnerabilities as well, and do a similar analysis of what does the landscape of vulnerabilities look like across the AI innovation space? Uh, that could be a potential direction uh, to head in as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, and stop here. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions and uh, we can go ahead and open it up uh, accordingly here. Yes. Um, why don't I go through a little bit of business before we pivot back to the questions and let people have some time to type. I know we've got one in the queue, so we'll just keep reading them as we go. Sure. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. Yeah, let me stop the share here. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Just go back here. Okay, so obviously it's time for questions. So go ahead and type your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. But uh, we've got some community updates. Uh, first, for those of you who are at, at going to EDUCAUSE, um, the Cybersecurity and Privacy Professionals Conference, we'll see you there. Um, that's that's coming in, in um, June 8th, I think is the, is the start date. Um, I will be sending out a blog post about trusted CI activities at EDUCAUSE. We have a ton of 
um, participation this year. So I'm very excited to share what our team members are doing at Educause. So we'll see you there. Our next webinar is Monday, June 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern. The topic is our Trusted CI Annual Challenge. So uh, every year we in the uh, past few years, we've given ourselves an annual challenge and this year it's software assurance. And so our presenter, we're still um, ironing out in a presentation, but it will be co-hosted with uh, Sean Pyser, who's leading that program for Trusted CI this year. Um, also Trusted CI partner, the, the Research SOC, um, they have a webinar coming up that might be interesting to those in the community, um, building a vulnerability management workflow that works and getting buy-in to actually implement it. And that's going to, um, that's later this week, actually, Thursday, May 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can find out more by going to researchsoc.iu.edu uh, um, and you can find their webinar link there or um, we have it in the slides as well. And then um, Research SOC also hosted a, a webinar on the Trusted CI framework. Um, I, I mentioned this last month, but I just want, wanted to give one more plug for it. Um, so you can go in, and see that presentation by uh, Trusted CI team member, Craig Jackson. And then also one more thing, this is a new thing. I'm going to be officially announcing it probably tomorrow. Uh, Trusted CI has a podcast. We have been converting these audio files to a podcast uh, version so that those of you who want to stay up to date with the webinars but maybe don't have the time to to watch the presentation can get caught up uh, via audio and so if, if you go to apple or if you go to google podcasts or other uh, very common podcast catchers that catch public uh, publicly hosted podcasts you can type in uh, trusted ci podcast and you'll should you should be able to find us there so with that i just want to Thank you. And we'll go back to our questions. Okay, so we had a question here. Um, do you see the types of vulnerabilities correlated with the language being used, uh, scientific domain and or the time of the code committed? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And this is something that um, as we're going ahead and expanding the level of our analysis, first of all, Jay, thank you for, for, that, for that excellent question. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to see exactly those things. So our first battle is getting the uh, results, the you know the entire workflow working and, and, and so on for, for something like this. So we'd like to go ahead and do exactly all of those things that were suggested. Are there specific vulnerabilities that are associated with more with particular languages over the other one? How do the vulnerability landscapes compare over different scientific domains? And then also the time of the code uh, being committed as well. That's also a very high interest as well. Is there almost like a seasonality? Uh, is there a way that we can employ predictive analytics to identify when a new vulnerability would be in, in included into the environment? So those are all areas that we've thought of. We have not yet gotten into, uh, into that particular space yet, just expanding out the analysis a, a, a little bit further after this one. And then we've got a follow-up. Do you have any insights on how the quality of your method may be affected by the quality of the code being examined? Yeah, right now we don't uh, we don't look again. Thank you, Jay, for that for that excellent question. Um, the we don't look into the quality of the code yet. Uh, that is a factor that we can consider because some of the code that may be on there may be student developed code that's more a little bit more spaghetti code and and so on. You know, just because you know last rush to the dissertation defense and and that type of thing. So we don't have any insights on that right now. Uh, looking into that, you know, looking into code quality and injecting that into the analysis could be an important factor in terms of continuing to wait the embedding generation process a little bit further. If we know that there is a, a set of repositories that are known to have a lower quality code for whatever reason, right? And But they're not as important as some of the other repositories just due to how they're being phased out. That would be important information to also inject into the embedding generation process to conduct finer grain clustering as well. But as of right now, looking into the quality of the code, we don't we don't have an idea about that yet. We've kind of just taken the code and then run the scanners on top of them and then gone ahead and done the analysis uh, subsequently, but not necessarily considering code quality yet, as of yet. Oh, how about this? Are you planning on sharing your research um, with private non non academic sector? I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to share it out first to the uh, academic sector first, because I think with the private one, they may uh, 
they may be already doing a similar type of analysis from the perspective they're employing their GitHub vulnerability assessment tools that are enabled by GitHub, but they're you know using it internally for, for, for themselves. So I'd like to first do the academic community uh, first before the uh, private sector. I think the academic community is one that's much more uh, of a ripe and open playground to uh, explore in. And I, I think the impacts there could actually be uh, a lot more significant than in the in the private sector, not that they wouldn't be as significant in the private sector. But I think the other part, too, is that there are some companies that are doing some level of analysis in the space, not employing AI techniques, but identifying secret uh, exposure and, and, and that type of thing. So TBD on the private sector would like to, but I think academic realm is where we'd like to stick in right now. And then we've got um... How much effort, time, FTEs, et cetera, was needed to generate the reports for the second case studies? And what are your thoughts on applying the process to other projects in general? Yeah, so the effort to generate the uh, case study, we can do any project within, I'd like to say three to four days. And the bottleneck there is the initial collection and vulnerability assessment scan. Once those data are in, the remainder of the procedures are completely automated. We can generate those results within a matter of hours. Uh, and do we wanna apply it to other projects? Yeah, ab you bet we do, absolutely we do. I, I think that that's really, really important, both from the perspective of what are the different organizations uh, <clears throat> that could be uh that could be leveraging uh you know github repositories but also what does the larger academic landscape uh look like uh, as well uh in terms of the different types of vulnerabilities and so on and so forth um i should also ask the question feel free to you know put it into the chat would is this interesting would this be useful uh to do it on other projects i should ask that question back out to the uh community as well i don't know if we can get a response to that too <laughs> Well, if you're okay with it, I can definitely uh, include your contact info and the follow up uh, yeah. email that I, where I sent the the links in the in the video as well. Yeah, so, but we've got um, one more question because it looks like uh, you answered. We had two questions in in this person saying you answered it already. So one more question here. You've highlighted a few examples of high severity vulnerabilities for CI two and public code on GitHub. Are they fixed? Any concerned about sharing those details publicly? Yeah, the detail. Yeah, we're we're very concerned about sharing those details uh, publicly, and we've already communicated the results of the uh, these vulnerability assessment scans. We try to hold um, workshops with with these partners to share the results back with them, and they have continuous access into our databases to uh, to see what kinds of vulnerabilities are are being identified and, and scanned for, and so on. They've told us that they fixed it, um, at least for their root repositories. I don't know on their their forked repositories how much of a how much information is still uh, uh, publicly accessible uh, there. But at least in their root environments, they uh, have, have indicated that they have addressed those vulnerabilities. Okay, let's do a last call for questions. Um, while people are typing, I just wanna say thank you so much, uh, Sagar, for presenting. And um, just so you know, in the community, we will be sending out a copy of the video as well as a link to the slides. So if you wanna share this with uh, colleagues, please do. Um, any final comments or thoughts? Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to, um, to present. This is, a, this is a lot of fun for me. And I, I think that we're just scratching the surface in this, in this particular area and hope that we can uh, make some good impact here. So uh, seeking any collaborators, if anybody has interest in this particular topic, you know, building out the research groups so that we have more capacity to, solve, to address some of the issues uh, that we had identified. Great. Um, with that, I just want to say thanks everyone who um, attended and participated in the chat. This was great. I love I love interaction with the audience. And um, we'll wrap things up. Uh, everybody have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.